in the year of 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. He wanted what all men wanted, money. The spice and silk trades with the Asian countries was a profitable business. He wanted to be a part of it. For a long time, Europeans had traveled eastward overland on the Silk Road to reach the countries of India and China. But the route was difficult and dangerous. Those merchants brave enough to make the journey over the white hot sand dunes in the deserts. Formidable mountains, brutal winds, and poisonous snakes. And if they survived all of that, there were many times they were met with bandits and pirates who would try to steal their goods. But Italian explorer and navigator Christopher Columbus believed that a faster trade route could be established by, by traveling east across the Atlantic Ocean. The trade winds of the east would be used to propel a ship across the open ocean and into the riches of Asia. He gained the support of King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella in the Spanish kingdom and set out in August. Of 1492. On August 3rd, 1492, Columbus left Spain with 87 men aboard three vessels, the Nina, Pinta, and Santa Maria. 29 days later, on October 12th, Columbus made landfall in the Caribbean on an island that is part of the Bahamas today. He called the island San Salvador. He began exploring the surrounding islands, including Cuba and Hispaniola. Columbus returned to Spain in March 1493 with a ship filled with kidnapped natives, exotic plants, and a small amount of gold. He was hailed a hero, and a delighted Ferdinand and Isabella continued to bankroll Columbus's voyages. Between 1493 and 1504, he made three more transatlantic trips to the Caribbean, coming back each time with fewer treasures. Columbus took his last trip to the Caribbean in 1504. When he returned at age 53, he was in poor health and nearly blind. Columbus died in Spain on May 20th, 1506, at the age of 55. Though he never found a sea route to the Orient, his pioneering voyages opened a new world to European exploration and expansion. A new era had been ushered in of European exploration and expansion. The new land would be claimed by kingdoms and fought over to keep. But even with the riches in the new land, one thing remained the same. Discover a water route to Asia. Going around the tip of South America it took too long and explorers looked to the north. Successfully navigate the icy seas of the Arctic and you can revel in the abundance of silks and spices to trade. The mission for all kingdoms was to find a northwest passage. For over 300 years, voyages would be sent out north of the Americas, and some would never return. One of those voyages was the Franklin Expedition in 1845 from Great Britain. They were sure that they could reach the trading riches in the West. A spring morning in 1845, at the offices of the British Admiralty, Sir John Franklin, a seasoned naval captain, receives final orders before setting off on a daring voyage of exploration. Now, Sir John, this is the plan. His destination, the Northwest Passage, one of the last unexplored waterways in the world, and perhaps the most perilous. And then attempt to turn south or southwest into these uncharted waters. At this time, the only way to reach Asia is to make an arduous journey around Cape Horn, a trip that can take six months. The British believe that there is a shortcut, a passage through northern Canada that may shave months off the trip. But after 300 years of trying to penetrate the Arctic ice, no ship has ever sailed all the way through. It's a puzzle. It's a matrix, like a maze. The winds are blowing the ice around. The currents are pushing the ice. And for a ship to traverse that was next to impossible. Mm -hmm. 
The British believed they were ready to make this hard trip because of all of their new technological innovations of the century. This expedition will be the 19th attempt by the British Navy to punch through the passage. And this time, they're pulling out all the stops. John Franklin is one of Britain's most experienced Arctic explorers. At age 59, he may be too old for such a voyage, but finding the passage has been his life and dream, and his wife, Lady Jane Franklin, has given him her blessing. South, south, west, degrees, please. He and his second, Francis Crozier, another veteran explorer, will lead the largest and most technologically advanced Arctic expedition ever mounted. 134 men on board the Terror and the Erebus, a pair of modified warships. Already among the sturdiest in the fleet, each has been radically altered for duty in the Arctic. Shipwrights reinforced their superstructures and added iron plates to the bow. They installed a locomotive steam engine, turning a screw-shaped propeller, a new invention that will allow the ships to power through the ice as never before. You can sense the extraordinary confidence of people who pushed back the frontiers of nature through glories of the industrial revolution, this might that they suddenly had at their disposal. And so they built up this force and two great ships reinforced by steel, and this would be their fortress. Nineteen times they would attempt this journey, and they were sure that this would be the successful one. The riches of Asia awaited them. Also on board, a new technology designed to eliminate the hunger and sickness that often plagued long voyages. A 19th century invention that promised to feed the men as if they were back in London. Canned food. We will never starve again. It will nourish us through winter, spring, and summer. On an earlier Arctic expedition, Franklin and his crew had to hunt and scavenge for nourishment. Eight of them died of starvation. And he himself barely survived. We scraped lynchon off rocks and boiled it up with scrag ends and bits of bones. Arctic potage. <laughs> the story of his brush with death earned him a wry nickname, the man who ate his boots. But this time out, he intended to keep his shoe leather on his feet. They thought that they would eat like kings as they navigate the cold seas. But men did starve and many died, and their story would be pieced together through a variety of sources. The oral history of the Inuit tribe, the artifacts left behind, and an even more telling piece of evidence, the bodies. The Inuit told of an abandoned camp, a tent place, as Hall translated it. And it was a grisly sight. And they gave him a very vivid description of this place. They had seen tents on the land, bodies inside the tents, abandoned equipment. The Inuit placed the location of the camp somewhere on King William Island, the same island where the abandoned boat and the note had been discovered. They described the bodies they saw there. They said that the faces were black, a symptom of frostbite. They also said that the insides of the men's mouths were black as well. And that could only mean one thing. Three years into their Arctic journey, scurvy was ravaging the men. The British Navy had long known that lemon juice could stave off the disease. But what they didn't know is that the active ingredient, vitamin C, loses its potency over time. By 1848, the men would have begun to suffer the terrible effects of the disease. The men would have recognized the symptoms of scurvy, but they wouldn't have recognized the symptoms of an even more insidious illness that may have been affecting them. 
While performing autopsies on the three young sailors buried on Beachy Island, the investigators also removed hair and bone tissue for later analysis. In a Canadian laboratory, scientists found something surprising in those samples. Levels of lead, six to ten times higher than normal. Enough to cause severe lead poisoning. Where did it come from? They found that the food cans had been sealed with solder, a soft metal compound that contains lead. Chemical analysis showed that the lead in the cans matched the lead found in the bodies. It's like a fingerprint that was found in the bodies, in the organs, in the tissues, in the bone. And th that was the smoking gun. Apparently, the lead had contaminated the food, causing lead poisoning. A deadly illness. Symptoms include fatigue, confusion, and paranoia. Not enough by itself to cause death. But if the men were weakened by illness, the poison would have been a devastating complication. When you combine lead and scurvy, you suddenly have this tag team undermining the health of the crewmen. It really was a recipe for a mass disaster. And the key ingredient in that recipe? The very technology that was meant to keep them alive. We will never starve again. It will nourish us through winter, spring, and summer. A Northwest Passage would never be found. The ice was too thick to cut through, and the lead poisoning took many lives. The men had to abandon their boat and attempt to reach safety on foot. Three years after the expedition left England, the commander and 20% of the 128-man crew lay dead. Already, it was one of the deadliest disasters in the history of polar exploration. The final entry on the note said that the men had abandoned the safety of their ships and were now walking south. In that brief note, second-in-command Francis Crozier testified to a terrible truth. The expedition lay in ruins, and the chances of anyone getting out alive were rapidly fading. The boat they converted into a sled was filled with the crew's personal possessions. As it was later found by a search party led by Leopold McClintock, it's estimated to have weighed a staggering 1,400 pounds. After three years marooned in the Arctic, dying one by one, their overland escape attempt must have been an act of desperation. It would have been murderously difficult to haul such a heavy load through the snow. At some point, they apparently abandoned it on the west coast of King William Island. And it's there that the trail of clues runs out. No men survived the journey, and at last the world was ready to accept that there is no Northwest Passage to connect the riches of Asia to the European markets. But in these 300 years, to find one, new areas would be explored, animals discovered, land mapped out. New technology would be invented and stronger ships built. Although the attempt at a passage discovery was unsuccessful, its lasting impact remains today.